There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. We're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, we're doing some behind the scenes work here. So hop on, say hello. We want to know who's with us. I can see you all hopping on here. I can't actually see you, just so you know. It's not that we can see your faces. Um, so don't worry about that, but we can see your see names. You. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We're going to go live here on Facebook as well. So uh, Facebook participants, if you, even if you're catching the replay, let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to see where our people are. Thankfully, I'm not running the controls today, so we might actually record it today. As we it's all already are. recording. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I missed that step last week. And we probably had the so best exciting. webinar. Yeah, it was like the best stuff we've ever covered and <laughs> it just didn't get recorded. <laughs> no, it was good stuff. We did get a comment that someone was wondering where the recording was because they wanted to take more notes about it. Uh, so thank you, Alan. That made me feel good. And uh, welcome, everybody. So let's see. Curtis from Columbia, South Carolina. Hello, hello. Patrick from Tacoma. Welcome. And Terry and Eve Gray from Lakeville, New Brunswick, Canada. All right. Awesome. Good to have everybody here. And uh, yeah, keep telling us where you're from. Matt from Illinois. Good to see you, Matt. All right. How is uh, how's the farm life this this summer going? I believe you're a farmer, if I don't remember, or if I if I don't if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> All right. So let me do a quick little intro here, and welcome to another episode of the Barton Diabetes Webinar, where you can listen live and get your questions answered by a trusted medical doctor who practices functional medicine our own Dr. Scott Saunders. So today, our topic is going to be hypertension and diabetes, and also a little bit of an update on coronavirus slash COVID. So uh, I am Joe Barton. I'm the founder and CEO of Barton Nutrition and Barton Publishing. We've been delivering hope and healing since 2004 through natural remedies, and we've helped over a million people find relief from blood pressure and diabetes, acid reflux, many other ailments through our digital books, printed workbooks, and nutritional supplements. And with me as always is our trusted medical advisor, Dr. Scott Saunders. He's also our supplement formulator and he is mobile. He's driving back from the clinic to his home right now. So he should be there in a little while, but we're able to uh, keep rolling as usual here. So good stuff. Dr. Saunders has uh, he's a medical licensed medical doctor uh, in Santa Barbara, California. He's been specializing in functional medicine, using natural, effective, and functional remedies for over 25 years. Just hit a milestone there, Scott. That's great. Uh, he's successfully yeah. helped <laughs> successfully helped thousands of people overcome all sorts of health challenges, and he specializes in metabolic issues like diabetes, as well as senior care, as he directs a nursing home there in Southern California. So Dr. Scott and I have been hosting these webinars since August of 2019 as a free service to our Diabetes Solution Kit customers and others who want to help, uh, who we want to help uh, fix blood sugar issues. So here's that Diabetes Solution Kit that I talked about. And so we're helping people uh, overcome blood sugar issues uh, without the often painful and annoying side effects of medications that come from traditional medical uh, treatments and methods. So, all right. Uh, on today's call, Dr. Saunders is going to talk about hypertension. And I had a little bit of a misunderstanding of what that was and what it wasn't. So um, as a final uh, introduction here, one last thing, our disclaimer that this webinar is for informational purposes only, uh, which means we don't want you taking this as personal medical advice because everybody is unique with different medical histories and such. So, this should, uh, you should work with your own healthcare prov provider and practitioner. This information is not intended to pre prevent, diagnose, treat, or cure, or grow any new diseases. So, <laughs> all right. Our goal here is to uh, provide you with great information so you can live the life that God created you to live. Dr. Saunders, take it away. Let's get rolling. Hypertension and diabetes. I think. We'll start out with your question yesterday when we were discussing the, how to talk about hypertension. Um, then you asked about what's the difference between hypertension and high blood pressure. 
Um, so he's breaking up a little bit. So as you're going through a valley here, maybe I'll just quick ask the question or tell people what I asked. So I said, Dr. Saunders, isn't hypertension and high blood pressure the same thing? And he said, no, it's not. So um, yeah, let's dig into that. Uh, what's the difference between hypertension and um, high blood pressure? And Dr. Saunders, maybe disable your video for a little while until you get to a better spot and then we probably will be able to hear you better. So let's give that a try. If he's not already, well, he looks okay. frozen right now. Oh, there we go. Oh, and then he's gone. <laughs> well, all right, so I'll, I'll tell you what he said as we wait for him to get back on. So uh, hypertension is actually, let me get my, my text out, what he said. Basically, uh, oh, there he is. There he is. He's muted now. <laughs> Bear with us, everyone. We're, uh, we're rookies. The best part of our uh, webinars is that they're raw and these aren't scripted. We roll with the punches. And so yeah. you're getting real information in real time and you never know what's going to happen. So that's right. Dr. Saunders, if you could unmute yourself then we'll, we'll be ready to go. Maybe. <laughs> there. Okay. So uh, hypertension. Uh, is a condition of chronic high blood pressure. Your blood pressure can go up anytime for other reasons. So for example, if you're, if you're running uh, really fast, you need more blood pressure to split your blood, then your, your blood pressure may go up. That's not hypertension, that's just high blood pressure. If you're really stressed out about something and your blood pressure goes up, that could just be <laughs> um, due to, due to Excuse me, due to normal stress. Ah, we lost him again. I think he's going through some ups and downs and valleys and curves. So, oh, and there he's back. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Um, Dr. Saunders, it looks like you're back, but you are on mute. So, all right. Well, Leslie, tell us about your vacation. <laughs> you were gone last week and oh, we missed I, you dearly. Yeah, I, I was actually kind of weird to not be able to be on the webinar. So, um, hold on. I'm just trying to see if I can manage some of his controls. Here, so. mm. Yeah, it looks like he's still muted. Yeah. Okay. No, oh, there okay. we go. I should be on mute. I, uh, dang it. There. I should be unmuted now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, are we on? Yeah, we're on. Yep, go ahead. It's still a little okay, spotty, okay. but we'll do our best. Okay. Uh, it, it, it'll get better right up here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, hypertension is a condition where high blood pressure is just something that happens occasionally and, and it'll happen. Everybody's blood pressure goes up. The question we're asking is not, does it ever go up? Everybody's blood pressure goes up. So if you go into the doctor and you're really nervous about being in the doctor's office and your blood pressure goes up, then, uh, then the doctor says, oh, you have high blood pressure. Um, Sometimes they will start a medication uh, right away and say, oh my gosh, you have high blood pressure, you need medication. Um, but actually the research shows you have to have at least three readings and it's better to have more readings to determine if you really have hypertension or not. So some people only have high blood pressure and the blood pressure goes up and comes down. And that's what's so good about having home blood pressure monitoring for people who think they may have hypertension. Uh, be because if, the, uh, if they're monitoring their blood pressure and finding it goes up and then it goes down and it goes up and it goes down, that's actually a good thing. That's what it's supposed to do. Your pressure is supposed to be variable. It's not supposed to be the same all the time. It's not supposed to always be 120 over 80. It's supposed to come down to 120 over 80 when you're quiet and relaxed and not doing anything. So uh, the, the, the fact that the blood pressure goes up does not indicate that you have hypertension. If it never comes down, then you have hypertension. Does that make sense? Yes, 
That makes good sense. Yep. Got it. All right. So, so hypertension. Said, Joe, yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. What you said, Joe, yesterday was very applicable, and that is um, just like you can have high blood sugar and not have diabetes. Right. Just yep. because somebody gets high blood sugar does not mean they have diabetes. Diabetes is a consistently elevated blood pressure, a blood sugar that never comes down to normal. And mm. that's, uh, that's diabetes. Same, same issue. Okay, yeah, that made good sense. So, yep, hypertension is really just long-term elevated blood pressure numbers, just like diabetes is long-term elevated blood sugar numbers. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, we can see you again, uh, although it looks like it might be frozen. So, hmm, getting closer though, yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, blood pressure monitors at home. Uh, are, are most of those that you can buy at the local Costco or Walmart or whatever, are those <clears throat> good ones and reliable ones to use? Actually, they're really good. They're um, they're they're very reliable. Um, they they do measure uh, when when used properly. They measure blood pressure well. Um, they the the technology is really good now. Where um, they don't listen for a heartbeat like you do with a stethoscope when you're doing it manually. Um, they feel the pulse going through the the blood pressure cuff, and so they can tell. Uh, what the pressure is when the pulse goes through. So, as long as you're not moving around a lot, if you if you hold still, so that that so that the mechanism could measure that pulse in your arm, uh, they're they're very accurate. So, um, people often ask me, well, I want to use your blood pressure cuff because uh, it's accurate. I'm not sure if my mine at home is accurate. And what's really funny about that is um, they're often the same ones. Uh, you know. <laughs> The ones that you get at Costco, I'm like, oh, I got that one in my office, you know, and I bought it. For, I bought it for three times what it is here at Costco. <laughs> right. Because I got it from a medical supply place. Yeah. <clears throat> so tell us more about hypertension and and uh, the risks of, or you know the dangers of it or whatever. Okay. So this is really important because people worry about hypertension. And the reason they worry about hypertension is because we're told things like, like uh, hy hypertension is the silent killer uh, and that uh, you're going to get a stroke or a heart attack uh, or you know, you're going to die a horrible death if you have high blood pressure uh, or, or hypertension. Um, and uh, that is not really... Uh, the reality. The reality is that hypertension is associated with all those things. Um, and because there's an association, uh, there's always an assumption of causation. So, uh, but a really very interesting multiple studies over long periods of time um, have shown that people with high blood pressure do not necessarily get um, uh, get strokes. Um, there is a definite association. If you look at the line, uh, hyper, hypertension to strokes on a graph, and you graph that, it is a nice straight line where the more hypertension, more strokes. And there's like an, uh, it's like equivalent. But uh, if you take a blood pressure medication and lower somebody's blood pressure, the stroke risk does not go down. So there's an assumption that the cause is the stroke or the cause of the stroke is the blood pressure, but it's only an association because dropping the blood pressure with a medication does not drop your stroke risk. Your stroke risk still stays the same because there's an underlying cause of why your blood pressure is elevated, which also causes strokes. And, and if you don't deal with that, the underlying cause, all you're doing is dropping the blood pressure, then you haven't changed the reason why you get the strokes in the first place. Hmm. Okay. So we haven't talked a whole lot about strokes, um, but that is one of the biggest like things that, you know, problems with diabetes and hypertension and, and things like that. So let's dig into that. What is a stroke and what, why does it happen and how do we help it or prevent it from happening? Okay. A stroke is when the brain doesn't get enough um, oxygen. 
And it's usually caused when the, there's a blockage of the arteries. So if the artery uh, it isn't, blood isn't flowing through the artery to the brain, then the brain's going, oh, I need more oxygen. And that's a really interesting thing about hypertension. So um, people were going into emergency departments and uh, with, you know, having a stroke. And when they measure their blood pressure, it is through the roof. I mean, blood pressures of 250 over 150, these really high numbers that people are getting in the ER when they're in the middle of a stroke. <clears throat> so the doctors would be like, oh my gosh, we got to drop their blood pressure quickly. So they give them what's called sublingual nifedipine <clears throat> under the tongue um, to, to drop their, their blood pressure quickly. And uh, there did, the blood pressure dropped quickly and the stroke got worse and people died more often uh, mm. from the stroke. Uh, and, uh, and they said, no, that doesn't make any sense. We're getting their blood pressure down. Um, but, but they're getting worse strokes and worse death. Well, if you think about it, if, if you don't have enough blood flow to the brain, the brain's going, I need more flow and causing all your blood vessels to constrict in the body to get more blood flow up to your brain. Mm. But if you suddenly drop that blood pressure, now you've dropped the flow to the brain too. And so now you have even less blood flow. To, uh, to the area of the brain. And so the stroke uh, progresses and gets worse rather than better. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, wow. Isn't that amazing? Interesting. So, so, yeah, what do they so, do now? So some... part, of, part of the thing about blood pressure, uh, what we learned from that is that um, in often when people have high blood pressure, it's because the brain is saying, I need more blood flow. And especially with diabetes. Now, for those of you who have diabetes, this is really important. You need to know this, that when the brain isn't getting enough sugar, that's, that's sugar, um, then it doesn't have enough energy. And if there's not enough energy, it's, uh, the brain's going to go, I need more blood flow. And it's going to cause constriction of the blood vessels all over your body to push more blood up to the brain and increase your blood pressure. So your blood pressure is gonna go up just because you're not getting enough sugar to the brain. Remember we talked about this. When you have um, diabetes for a long period of time and your blood sugar is consistently elevated, elevated, never goes down to normal, um, then you have fewer blood glucose transport proteins to get sugar from the sh blood into the brain. Remember, sugar can't just get across there. It has to be transported across. And you have fewer transport proteins, so you're getting less sugar into your brain than you would uh, if you were um, than if you were if you had you know up and down blood blood sugar. So it's very common for people with with diabetes to get high blood pressure um, for no other reason than because their blood sugar has been high for a long period of time and their brain isn't getting enough sugar. So the blood pressure goes up. Mm. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm, very so, interesting. so we have to be really careful about our blood sugar and, and it does need to go down to normal periodically so we can increase those glucose transport proteins to get sugar into the brain. That's why Alzheimer's disease is, uh, is often being called type three diabetes because the, um, the blood sugar doesn't get into the brain and so the brain is literally starving for sugar. It's starving and the blood pressure goes up and then we take a bunch of medications to drop the blood pressure and now we don't have good blood flow to the brain. Um, and it just makes the problem worse over time. Mm. Oh, well, what do we do, Dr. Saunders? <laughs> well, well, that's the whole reason for the diabetes solution kit. Um, if you start off in phase one, phase one is a 20 gram... Uh, carbohydrate diet. You're not eating very much. 20 grams of carbohydrates. One orange would be like your entire day's supply of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not very much. It's very little. So what? So then your blood sugar is dropping down and, uh, and your insulin is dropping down. Then you make more glucose transport proteins. And so you're getting more sugar into your brain and refilling the brain. The brain's going, ah, at last, I have some energy. And, and then the blood pressure drops down automatically. 
Hmm. You don't need blood pressure medications, especially for diabetes. Wow. So there's a very strong connection between type two diabetes with high blood sugar uh, and hypertension slash, uh, yeah, high blood pressure. Yeah, and it's the it's the same reason why um, Alzheimer's disease is called type three diabetes. It, it's all connected. The whole thing is connected to this uh, chronic high blood sugar, and uh, and it, by dropping the blood sugar, so the diabetes solution kit starts out with you're gonna you're gonna uh, gradually drop off that blood sugar. It's gonna go down, 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 down. So when your blood sugar is in the seventy to ninety range. Um, <clears throat> then you're making glucose transport proteins and your brain is working again. And then uh, you don't get Alzheimer's disease and then your blood pressure drops down. So the blood pressure is dependent on the sugar as well. Yeah. Uh, so Leslie, could you do a little uh, sidebar infomercial here and tell people where, where can they get their hands on this diabetes solution kit that Dr. Saunders is referring to? Yeah, I think probably the easiest uh, way to do that, and I just posted this on Facebook, is to go to bartonwebinar.com. You'll find information uh, about these webinars, how to subscribe, and then also uh, how to get yourself a copy of this. Now, you can get a physical copy. You can get um, an emailed copy in a PDF form, uh, lots of different options. Many of the supplements that we talk about as well, you can find at bartonwebinar.com. So that's a good place to go. And... Again, let us know if you have questions about anything. You can send us um, a message even here in the chat, or if you're on Facebook, send it there. And um, also you can ask Dr. Saunders some questions now too. So make sure you're posting those and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Yes, and tell them about the YouTube channel and how they find that and why they'd wanna find that. Sure. Okay, so um, if you go to bartonwebinar.com, you'll find a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, once you click on that, hit the subscribe button because um, you, first of all, will get notified anytime we um, upload a new webinar like this one. And uh, you can also search our channel. We have covered so many topics. I think we've been doing this for getting close to a year, maybe. Yep. August. I don't know. We might have to have a celebration. We'll yeah. see. Uh, but we have covered so many important topics. Um, and we really look to your feedback to determine what um, things we discuss. So it's been, uh, our, our topics have pretty much been uh, customer picked. And so they are the things that you guys have been asking us about. So it is just, it's, it's like having a doctor in your back pocket. So <laughs> definitely utilize that YouTube channel, guys, and share it with your friends because this is kind of, you know, information that not everybody has access to and it's free. So definitely check that out. Okay, Joe, so my next t-shirt needs to say back pocket doctor. I know, that was so good. I just pulled that out of my back pocket. <laughs> How does it feel to ride around in hundreds of people's back pocket all the time? I know, right? <laughs> back pocket doc, that's what we'll call it. Hey, back pocket doc it. Well, <laughs> uh, well, good stuff. All right, uh, let's see if we've got any questions here. Leslie, you wanna get uh, yep. what we got here? Okay, so looks like the Larry has a good one in the Q and A there. Okay, Larry, why does my blood sugar rise from ninety six to one hundred four after exercise? No food was ingested before exercise. When should I move? Okay, second question. When should I move to phase two? I've been in phase one for two months. Oh, two questions. Okay, first question again. Yes. Why does my blood sugar rise from 96 to 104 after exercise? He did not eat before he exercised. Oh, that's an excellent question. Okay, so um, when you're exercising, you're using up the carbohydrates, sugar, uh, in your body, and, and your sugar starts dropping lower. And so you release a hormone called glucagon, among other things, that cause your liver to put out extra sugar because the key is your brain has to have a constant supply. Your heart has to have a constant supply because they don't store any energy. So the muscles start using up their storage of energy um, and uh, of, of glucose, which is called glycogen. They use it up and, uh, and then, uh, so then uh, the blood sugar starts dropping low and the liver makes more sugar to keep it in that 
you know, 70 to 90 up to 100 range. So, uh, so it, and because, because you've had an issue with diabetes, it, it can go up into the low hundreds and that's, that's actually okay. Okay, second part of the question is, when do you go to phase two? Okay, that's an excellent question. Everybody should know this because it's going to be different for every single person. Some people need to go into phase two um, like right away because they, have, they don't have a lot of insulin resistance. And uh, so they don't require a long time in phase two. The easiest way to do that, especially if you're measuring your blood sugar, is just when your fasting blood sugars are between 70 and 90 consistently in that range for, I don't know, a week or two weeks or something like that, when you're getting into that range, um, then you know that you're ready. Um, to start into phase two. And you're going to keep measuring your blood sugar as you're going into phase two so that you know what kinds of foods are going to affect you and how they're going to affect you. I like this uh, comment here on Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and read this. This is from April. April, thank you for joining us. Uh, she says, I'm pregnant and I found out that I have high blood pressure and diabetes. I can eat 15 snack carbs, 45 dinner. It's scary trying to, to keep in the numbers. I did not know all the foods that have carbs and a lot of healthy food has high carb count. So it's not easy to eat well. This is all new to me. Just wanted to share that. Wow, that's great. Um, it's good. It's good to learn more about the foods that we're putting in our body. So first of all, congratulations for doing that. It, I mean, you're making great steps toward getting healthy. Uh, let's see here. I was going to read another one. Need a bigger screen here. Got too many things going on. Okay. This is from Kim and this is on Facebook as well. What is the optimal fasting blood glucose for a hypertensive 56 year old man? Hey, I'm 56. Okay. This is easy. Um, <laughs> the optimal glucose is between 70 and 90. Um, and um, for hypertension, especially because if you have uh, a hypertension because your brain is starving, then, uh, then that will allow you to make the more glucose transport proteins to allow uh, more sugar into the brain so that you uh, can drop your blood pressure down to normal because the brain will go, ah, I feel better. So keeping that uh, 70 to 90 um, on a fasting uh, blood glucose. So for example, after you eat, it can go up to 100 or 102, 103. Um, that's okay. But, but while you're fasting, that 70 to 90 is, is the benchmark. Okay. Thank you. All right, Joe, did you see some on here in the chat? I wanted to, I think there was something in here. Um, okay, Krish, welcome back. Krish got their order of Nervala. Um, in regards to benfetamine, benfetamine, is this the same as benfotiamine? Are we dealing with the US, UK English problems? <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. So, benfetamine. I don't know what that is either. Um, <clears throat> I know I know what benfotiamine is, vitamin B1. Um, but I don't know what benfetamine is. Okay. All right. If you want to, Chris, Chris, if you're still on, if you want to maybe um, post a little bit more about that, that would be wonderful. I love this. Patrick says that he actually got a cuff style uh, blood pressure tester from Costco for $40. And you had mentioned uh, typically some of those that you even can find at Costco are just as nice as the ones that you get, Dr. Saunders. Oh, so, and they cost me $150. <laughs> so good to know, good to know. Um, okay, Krish, I have a friend and she says that whenever she goes to the doctor's office, her blood pressure is high. The doctor says it's called the white coat syndrome. When she measures uh, the blood pressure at home, it's within a lower range. Is this scenario a high blood pressure scenario or hypertension? Thanks. Ah, excellent question. Okay, that's a high blood pressure. The blood pressure goes up um, when somebody's in a situation that is whatever brings on some kind of anxiety, uh, causes constriction of the blood vessels, which raises the blood pressure. That's normal, you can't fix normal. So that's the advantage of having a blood pressure cuff at home because 
if you can measure it in a quiet and relaxed state and you're finding, gosh, you know, in the morning when I wake up, my blood pressure is a little higher one at night. Um, before I go to bed, it's a little lower. Um, but it consistently comes down to normal sometimes. So there's, so it goes up and it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. That's not hypertension. Um, that is uh, your blood pressure goes up. That's high blood pressure. <clears throat> hypertension is when it's, um, you know, uh, the lowest it gets, for example, is 150 over 90, uh, then, then you uh, may have a hypertension issue. Uh, uh, if, if it goes up to 150 over 90, but, but then goes down to 126 over 85, then, then you're okay. That you're not, you're not a hypertensive. You don't have a condition of hypertension. That's the difference. Excellent okay. question. Um, here's another question from Curtis. How long should I continue on the diabetes reversal plan when my average gluco glucose level is around or below 100 milligrams per day or per week? Yeah, the, um, in, in a, a, a day or a week, I, I'm not sure what the question is, but um, the answer is to continue on the program forever. Because when you go into phase three, that's the that's the uh, you know moving on, so to speak, and you're you're there for the duration. You're you're there forever. Um, because why? Well, think about it. You, there was a reason you got diabetes in the first place. Um, people often think that they're going to oh, I'm going to go on this little diet program and then I'm going to fix the diabetes and then I'm going to go back to to eating the way I was before. Well, what's going to happen? That's what got you there in the first place. So the way I look at it is this is the forever program. You know, it's just like um, the, the woman you were talking about who's uh, pregnant and she's going, oh my gosh, I didn't realize all these foods I'm eating have carbohydrates in them. And, uh, and this is why I ended up with pre uh, um, gestational diabetes and hypertension. So, uh, so then she's learning about, uh, what, about what has carbs and what doesn't and uh, what things are healthy and not from her point of view. So you're taking healthy food from your own point of view because you have this condition of diabetes. Then you have to say, okay, from a diabetic point of view, what is a healthy food? Um, and that may be different from people who don't have diabetes, who can eat mangoes all the time and, and, uh, and pineapple and watermelon uh, and, and even live, be a fruititarian and live on fruit. But you would say, mm, I'm going to limit the amount of uh, mangoes and, and watermelon I eat. Um, you know, I'll have it occasionally, but it's not going to be something I eat every day. Um, because for you, a healthy food is going to be something that has uh, relatively low carbohydrate content. One of the things that I really appreciated was a couple of weeks ago, we had on our friend Dana Cushing, and she talked about how, um, you know, you're not saying no to good food. You, there are options for you, you know, uh, as she had mentioned, um, making a, a healthy version of brownies, you know, so if you were really craving those, you could have that eventually. It's not that you're never going to taste good foods anymore. Your taste buds change through the process as well. And uh, you start to crave healthy foods because you feel so good. But then there are options, which for me, I, you know, I've, I have young kids and so I want to be able to still give them really fun foods, but the healthier versions of them. So lots of options out there. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do another question here from Curtis. Is glucerin a good beverage to drink during the first week of the diabetes reversal plan? Uh, yeah. I think it's glucerna possibly, but I could be wrong. I okay. couldn't find a glucerin. So is that okay. cool? Scott, do you know? Yeah, probably glucerna. Um, glucerna is a shake. It's a um, diabetes shake, and um, it is it is a low carbohydrate beverage, and uh, it does have a vitamin pill. So it's essentially soy oil, um, uh, uh, some protein would be like uh, non-fat dried milk, uh, non-fat dried milk, soy oil, and uh, and some water, and then a vitamin pill, and then they flavor it. Um, <clears throat> um, and, uh, I don't agree with them. I don't, I don't like any of those diabetes drinks and think about this. Remember we talk about artificial sweeteners and how for many people who have diabetes, anything sweet <clears throat> raises the blood pressure, 
blood sugar or blood, uh, the insulin um, and makes them more insulin resistant. So if, if you're drinking anything sweet, especially drinks, but, uh, but eating even anything sweet, even though it has no sugar in it, uh, it can make you more resistant to insulin and perpetuate the problem. So it doesn't necessarily uh, make you better just because it's low in carbohydrates. So, you know, yes, technically, if you look on the label, the label says, um, you know, zero carbohydrates. Uh, but, but because it has artificial sweeteners, I still don't recommend it. And I was just looking this up and finding uh, different labels for glucerna. And they, they range anywhere from like 16 grams of carbs to, I saw one that was like 51 grams of carbs. So that seems pretty high. And then um, I also was looking at the ingredients and it has like sucralose and acesulfame, sulf or potassium, which is like artificial sweeteners as well. So, um, and that kind of leads us into Curtis's next question. Uh, do you subtract alcohol sugars from the total carbs? And can we chew gum like Mentos uh, or cough drops like Ricola without sugar? <laughs> okay, same, the same issue. So um, what Leslie was just talking about of you know, if your taste buds change, um, I think during phase one, it's very important to change your taste buds uh, by avoiding... Uh, anything that uh, that is sweetened whether it's artificial sweeteners or whatever instead of drinking things that have uh, sweetener sweeteners in them just drink water um, instead of, of having like uh, cough drops and things like that um, uh, try to find things that don't like I know there's some uh, zinc lozenges vitamin C zinc lozenges that don't have any sweeteners in them um, uh, they're really sour though. <laughs> they don't taste good. <clears throat> but it changes your, uh, your taste buds over time when you don't have this barrage of sweet, constant uh, sweetness. Um, uh, my, my son and I were talking yesterday about, you know, why do they put sugar in gravy? You know, you think gravy is like, uh, it's supposed to be a savory kind of flavor, but you look on it and Gosh, it's not just a lot of starch. They actually put a lot of sugar in it. And, and, and so we expect that everything's going to be sweet, even like our meat sauces, uh, like A1 sauce or barbecue sauces, like they're filled with sweeteners and ketchup's filled with sweeteners. Um, so avoid all that stuff during phase one, and you'll do a lot better for what Leslie was talking about, changing your taste buds so that you can taste the difference between, uh, you know, a sweet almond, uh, a, a raw almond's really sweet, and a roasted almond uh, is uh, is not not sweet. And just being able to taste the difference is uh, it's really cool. Yeah, and you've talked about even like stevia, which most people think stevia is fine, but again, it's that sweet taste. It doesn't really matter so much if it's artificial or natural. If it's sweet, it's going to make your pancreas squirt out insulin and be looking for sugar, right? Yep, so that's, that's the deal. Yeah, so it's a pancreas reset. It's a whole body reset. All right, let's see here. Do we have some more Q uh, questions here in the Q&A, Leslie? Yes, we do. And we have some on Facebook too. So first of all, I'm just gonna uh, comment here. Let's see, James uh, is an 80 year old male type two diabetic and he wants to know if it can be reversed. Oh my goodness. Of course, James, age just doesn't matter. It's uh, resistance to insulin. It's just metabolism. Your metabolism can change all the time. When someone takes up running, they have a different metabolism um, than when they're sedentary. Um, when they eat certain things, they have a different metabolism than when they don't. Um, the, it, your metabolism can change at any age. So the answer is yes. Uh, and the way to fix your metabolism is the same kind of thing. You can still uh, eat, you just uh, avoid uh, carbohydrates so that the uh, you can start burning fat, training your body to burn fat. And so it's a process of training. It's not an overnight thing, but yeah, anybody could do it. Awesome. That's good news right there. Okay. On Facebook, um, this is coming from Kim again, says my 30 year old daughter has been type one since the age of 10. She uses an insulin pump. She still has um, 
big swings. Any advice? She's a mom of three kiddos under five, and she's currently breastfeeding. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for asking this question. This, this is uh, a, an important thing. We were talking last time about type 1, type 2 diabetes, how you can have both type 1 and type 2 at the same time. Uh, and, and this is that kind of thing. So here you have uh, a young child whose pancreas is not putting out insulin. And when there's no insulin, you have to have insulin. You just have to have it. Uh, so you can't just go on a diet and say, I'm not going to take insulin. You, you, you can't get sugar into your cells. You can't get energy into your cells uh, to, to burn. And so um, you would just starve to death. So yes, this, this little girl, she needs an insulin pump and she has to have that insulin. Okay, so now let's talk about the wild swings and what you can do about that. Um, the diabetes reversal program is about um, training the body to burn fat instead of carbs. So when, when somebody is type one diabetic and they're living exclusively on carbs, it's gonna be really hard to control because it's gonna be up when you eat and then down and then from the insulin and then up when you eat and then down from the insulin and then up and down, and up and down. And there's gonna be wild swings in blood sugar because of the, uh, the, the constant burning of carbohydrates. The body is made to have carbohydrates for a period of time after you eat and then be able to switch to fat burning and move forward uh, on fat. So it's the same kind of thing. Train the body to burn fat. And in the process of that training, um, the wild swings in blood sugar won't happen as much. You're going to have some swings, of course, because keeping up with the uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a process, you know, it's hard to do to keep the blood sugar from externally. The pancreas does such a good job of keeping your blood sugar stable. Uh, and we have to measure it from the outside and, and give the insulin and it goes up, down and then, it, then you eat and it goes up and uh, it's hard to control from the outside. Um, so that's a part of it, but there will be some benefit in, in uh, having the body learn how to burn fat. And, and the way that's done is, is eating fewer and fewer carbohydrates and keeping that relatively low and allowing the body to burn fat so the swings aren't as wide. Uh, this question is from Monica on Facebook. I have high blood pressure. It's always high. What can I do to get it on a normal level? Okay. Okay. Excellent question. So um, if, if you don't know why you have high blood pressure, then that's the first place to start is to say, I have blood pressure because why? Well, because is my brain starving for oxygen? Do I have clogged arteries in my neck or, or some, or clogged arteries in my heart? Um, <clears throat> is, is there a problem with the autonomic nervous system in controlling the blood pressure, the temperature? Um, uh, is there a problem with sugar? Am I not getting enough sugar into my brain like we were just talking about? Uh, because the blood sugar has been high for a long period of time. So uh, finding out why you have this chronic high blood pressure and, uh, and, and then dealing with that uh, is, is by far clearly the best way to go. So once you deal with the cause, once your brain's getting enough oxygen, getting enough sugar, um, then the, the brain goes, ah, wow, okay, I got enough energy and can relax the blood vessels and allow, allow um, <clears throat> the, uh, the blood pressure to drop down to normal. Uh, and so knowing why would be the first step to start. I have a quick question, Scott. Uh, does it matter if you're taking your blood pressure with your feet on the floor and relaxed or crossing your legs as I am right now or anything like that? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, but those are all minor, uh, minor issues. Um, th they don't really make a big difference in what the blood pressure is. I've had people... Uh, come into my office with that white coat hypertension and uh, and I tell them, okay, <sighs> relax, sit on the floor uh, or sit on the on your seat straight up, um, put your feet on the floor and uh, take a deep breath <gasps> and hold it. And I have them hold it for 20 seconds and then, and then let it relax, uh, let it out. And then take another deep breath <gasps> as much as they can and hold it for 20 seconds and then, and then gradually let it out and then do that three times 
and then take their blood pressure. And I've had people go from 180 to 140 uh, in, in a matter of a few minutes of, of doing those uh, kind of yoga breathing exercises. Um, there's also something else that helps the blood pressure go down and that's exercise. And there are certain kinds of exercise that help more than others. Um, doing sprints um, or um, there was an interesting study for pilots uh, because pilots aren't allowed to take blood pressure medication or this was Navy pilots. Uh, and so they developed a, a grip strength uh, machine uh, mm -hmm. where they would, they would hold their grip uh, tight at a, at a certain amount and then let it out a certain amount and let it out a certain amount. And so they had a, a grip strength machine. And as they worked on their grip, um, on um, keeping their grip constant for a, a certain period of time, a minute, it's only like a minute or two, um, <clears throat> then their blood pressure would come down and, uh, and they, they would actually have normal blood pressure. <laughs> so mm. Uh, th there's there's much more to blood pressure than than what we think of. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, stress. If you have a lot of stress, your blood pressure is going to go up. That's just the what happens uh, from stress. So uh, doing relaxation exercises is often very helpful for bringing blood pressure down. Okay, here's another good question. Uh, when a diabetic who is on metformin XR is also lactose intolerant, he or she is forced to take commercially available lactase supplements, but these are not always effective and the gas and the bloating problems continue. Dr. Saunders, do you have a solution to this problem? How can one make the body start making lactase again? Oh, man. I, I've, I had a case of... Uh, a a, a patient from China, uh, and there's there's actually a lot of people in China that have uh, milk intolerance due to lack of this lactase, and uh, he really liked ice cream. So um, he would take little spoonfuls at a time, and then add a little more and a little more and a little more. And over a period of it was months, uh, it was a long time, months. Um, he was able to eat uh, more than just a spoonful of ice cream without getting gas and bloating. Uh, I, I guess he induced his uh, lactase uh, over time to be able to tolerate it. Uh, you know, the simple answer is don't eat it. But, uh, but in his case, he really liked ice cream and that's what he wanted. So, uh, so he developed his tolerance over time um, or, or, I guess he increased his lactase enzyme because he was able to tolerate it better. I don't know. All right, what do you think? One more question, Joe? Let's do it. And Patrick had a question about he wanted to get a copy of the printed workbook. So I posted that in the chat uh, for you, Patrick. But if you do go to bartonwebinar.com and then if you click on the Diabetes Solution Kit from there, that's actually the digital version. But if you snoop around a little bit on that. Uh, that's basically our store link. And then you can go up to the menu and you can find the printed workbook available from there as well. And we'll try to get that uh, Barton webinar updated soon here with that new link as well. But yeah, let's find, let's get one more question answered here before we sign off for the day. All right, let's ask this from Larry. By improving my blood sugar and reversing type two, will I be able to quit Xarelto daily? X-A-R-E-L-T-O. Yeah, okay, um, maybe, but you can't be sure. So that's where you really have to work with your doctor because that's a blood thinning medication. And the purpose for that is usually because somebody has like atrial fibrillation where their heart beats irregularly. And if the heart's beating irregularly, then it can develop clots inside the heart that then uh, break off and go into the body. And since the brain gets 20% of the blood flow, uh, you have a 20% chance of that clot going up into your brain and plugging something up and causing a stroke, which we were just talking about. Then your blood pressure will go up. Um, so, so the Xarelto, that's a great question. And you, you just have to work with your doctor on that because there's other reasons for taking that that are not related to diabetes. <laughs> well, here's some more information about it too. Uh, he said, I had a DVT, would that be like deep vein thrombosis? 
Yes. Okay, in 1994. Then again in 2017 for a uh, leg blood clot 23 years later. I'm told I must continue blood thinner for life. Okay, so um, there's, there's two things you can do for that. If you know why you're getting blood clots, so if you have, um, there's uh, a, a genetic disorder that people get uh, blood clots more easily than others. Um, I actually have it. I have a factor five laden uh, deficiency. Um, I have the gene, but let me tell you, I get nosebleeds and stuff, and I, I know that I don't have a clotting problem. Um, but there are certain clotting problems, genetic clotting problems, that if, if you have one of those, and they're all testable, uh, if you have one of those, yeah, you probably do need a blood thinner for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you're at risk. It's not that you're going to get one for sure, but the, the blood thinner will decrease your risk. Um, if, you do, if you have, there are certain ones that you can, uh, you can use natural ways of dissolving clots uh, or preventing clots. Um, but, um, but, you know, you have to know why it is first, because there's a reason you got two um, clots in your veins, in your legs. Um, and if that happened twice uh, and, and you don't know why, then the next step is to know why. All right. Um, we had mentioned at the beginning of the call that we we're going to do a little update on COVID coronavirus and kind of talk about how uh, hypertension and diabetes are both like strong cor comorbid morbidities and correlation to that. Scott, could you give us a little update here, June 23rd, 2020, where we're at and yeah, what's the latest? Okay. Okay, so uh, coronavirus is a, a virus that's been around for many, many, many years. Uh, this is a new type of coronavirus um, that, uh, uh, but the coronavirus has been studied and we know that there are a certain number of people who get pneumonia from coronavirus. Uh, it increases their risk for diabetes. Um, that wouldn't be true with like influenza. You don't see people that get influenza pneumonia end up with diabetes, but it is something that you see with coronavirus. And perhaps it's because this virus binds to a receptor uh, called an ACE2 receptor um, that is found in the, the cells of the pancreas. So it could be that the, the virus can actually get into the pancreas and create the um, uh, diabetes. So you can increase your risk of diabetes um, with uh, the coronavirus may increase your risk of, of diabetes by because of pancreatic inflammation. Um, but the other part is that if you have diabetes and you get an infection, you are at greater risk for, uh, for dying from the virus. And the reason for that is because diabetes increases your risk for inflammatory conditions anyway. So you have more inflammation in your body and you add in this virus that creates um, DIC, a, a disseminated uh, coagulation of your, of your arteries from inflammation, uh, fills up your lungs. And so uh, you're, you're just adding on to that burden of, of inflammation. So uh, di and uh, hypertension is a little different issue. Uh, hypertension, remember that ACE, the, 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 the virus binds to that ACE receptor? People with hypertension are often on uh, medications called ACE inhibitors, and it blocks their, their angiotensin converting enzyme. So what happens is the, 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 your cells in your body make more of that receptor. And uh, in one study they showed there were five times more receptors for that ACE uh, in people with hypertension taking ACE inhibitors uh, than, than in people who didn't have hypertension and weren't taking ACE inhibitors. So, uh, so the, now you have five times more receptors for the virus uh, than a normal person does when you have, uh, co uh, I, for the virus COVID-19, uh, when you're taking an ACE inhibitor. So uh, that particular medication may put you at greater risk. We don't know if it does, but we do know uh, the CDC puts out st statistics on comorbidities and um, hypertension was a greater uh, risk or comorbid condition associated with hospitalization, even than diabetes, even though diabetes is uh, prevalent in about half the population. Um, so, so there may be some 
correlation there. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, good to know. And I was going to ask about like this turmeric BP is one of our products that is, uh, it's got turmeric and uh, bioperin and turmeric root extract, but this is an anti-inflammation and like natural product. And between that and Cinechroma, is that uh, like, do you recommend that for people with these things and does it help um, build the immune system and in and, and that and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it, it, it's quite remarkable that, that those happen to show up at this time that we, we develop these uh, particular things because um, the uh, turmeric is a great anti-inflammatory. It works in the genetics uh, to, to decrease the production of inflammatory mediators, which is exactly what you would want if you have this virus so that you don't get a, 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 an ex excessive response of inflammation, which is really what people die from. Uh, they don't die from the virus itself as a rule, uh, unless they're suppress their immune system. And then the other one, the Cinechroma, contains a sufficient amount of vitamin D uh, to actually improve your immune system and allow uh, your immune system to, to get rid of the virus before it becomes, before you become a virus factory. Mm -hmm. And the selenium in there, it seems like that's very important to have proper levels of that as well. Yeah, that's, that's really important for immunity. So when people are going out in public, should we be wearing masks if we have uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, washing our hands? Is that, how does that compare to building up your immune system and other, other things we can do? Okay, um, I, I, I have issues with this um, because uh, on the one hand, um, the regulations, uh, not laws, but regulations and uh, uh, and our, our government officials are telling us that we should wear masks and all that. Um, but uh, but the, the idea that a mask is going to protect you from a virus is really not correct. That's not a good way to look at it at all because even the best masks, even the best hand washing, even the best of everything, if you're wearing an N95 mask and, uh, and you have uh, protective uh, uh, cl clothing on uh, uh, PPE, um, and uh, and uh, you're washing your hands frequently, changing gloves. Um, the best we can ever do for healthcare personnel, and the the research that's been done is about 50%. So you can cut your risk by about 50%, but that's not getting rid of it. That's not preventing it. That's that's decreasing your risk. So. Uh, that's all a statistical analysis, and it doesn't say, oh, I'm not going to get it because I was wearing a mask. Um, mm. That's not a good way to look at it. Yes, it can decrease your risk. So, fine. Wear your mask when you're out in public, when you're going into the store, uh, all of those things. That's okay. That's, that's not a problem. But don't think that you're going to yeah, – that you're not going to get it, that you're not going to be exposed to it because you're wearing a mask. It just decreases your risk. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So yeah. So really like right now is the best time to be eating low carbs and reversing your blood sugar problems and, and hypertension problems and like that. So following phase one in the diabetes solution kit. Um, yeah. Never a better time to do that now. So, all right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Saunders. Thanks everybody for joining us. A lot of great questions covered today. And uh, as always, it's great to be together. And so um, yeah. Any closing Comments or thoughts here, Scott? Yeah, just uh, on hypertension. Um, uh, it's really important to, to work with your doctor or a healthcare practitioner to understand why you have hypertension. Uh, you know, that's well, we, we came here today to talk about uh, hypertension and diabetes, and they are correlated and they are related. And there, there are risks associated with hypertension, but not because your blood pressure is high. So um, the other part, people often freak out about having, uh, they, they get very anxious because, oh, my blood pressure is elevated. And what does that do? It makes your blood pressure go up. <laughs> um, so one of the important things to understand is that you don't, you don't do damage to your arteries because of your blood pressure. But you need to know that the blood pressure is associated with a lot of conditions. And 
and that you have to find out why you have high blood pressure in order to bring that down to normal so that you decrease your risks and improve your life. Awesome. Yep. All right. Well, this has been great. Thanks again, Dr. Saunders. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. Great to have you back. And we actually recorded today, so <laughs> people can watch this later. <laughs> And uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see you guys next Tuesday at noon central. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. God bless. Bye. Bye.